Hello, hello. Let me know if you guys can hear me okay. <clears throat> Hola. Como esta? Excellent, excellent. All right, so we'll wait just a few minutes for everyone to come in. Today we are discussing chapter eight. We were supposed to discuss chapter eight last week, but I was traveling and so we scheduled it for this week so we can take our time and go through these wonderful principles. So I pray that you guys are doing well. Hello, Andrea. How are you? Happy Friday. I'm so excited about this lesson. It's, it's encouraging yet intimidating at the same time. And so um, I like lessons like this because you know, on one hand, you kind of wonder, like, you know, how and are we going to do this? And then on the other hand, you know, that God is able to do it. And so you have to let him do it. And so that is encouraging. All right. Well, it is 12 o'clock. So we will pray and get started. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to go through these lessons. I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to minister to our heart, to go before us and to prepare our hearts to receive these truths in spite of how difficult they may be at times. We know that you are able and we know that you are willing to transform us into your likeness. Be with us as we study. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, guys. So, obedience and discipline. And this chapter, this lesson, begins with the story of the rich young ruler. And I got my reading glasses here. I'm not sure to keep them on or off. I'll just keep them on. It begins with the story of the rich young ruler. <clears throat> and I like how I believe it was Sandy who sent out a message when we were first studying this of how the rich young ruler parallels the experience of Laodicea, who is rich, increased with goods, and has need of nothing. And so here we have this young man who was all these things. Yet, it, deep in his heart, he knew that there was something missing. And Ellen White points out, hi, Shermaine. Ellen White points out that what he thought he needed was, was just a blessing. Like, he didn't think there was anything wrong with him spiritually. He just felt like, you know, as Jesus is, is blessing the children and hugging and kissing the children... That if Jesus does this for him, then, you know, whatever this void is in his heart will be filled. And so he comes to Jesus, bless his heart, and he's so excited and he kneels before the master and he says, you know, what must I do? And one chapter it says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And we're told that Jesus looks at this young man and he loves him and he wants so much to save him and have him be a disciple. And he says to him, keep the commandments. And oh, he's excited now. Oh, oh, I do that. You know, all these things have I done from my youth up. What lack I yet? And he names, well, Christ names the commandments that he needs to keep. And he only names the commandments that are dealing with the neighbor. He doesn't list the first four commandments. He only deals with the commandments that are directly related to everyone's hello, to the relationship between mankind. And 
he he feels like he has done this as well and he tells him to go and sell his goods and come and follow him and at this command he is he's devastated he he's hopeless because like why would i do that how could i do that give up my riches to to come and follow christ i i don't know how i could do that and so he doesn't do it and then he he goes away and he is um you know he's devastated because as a child as a young man he has not cultivated the habit of unselfishness so the first thing that i really want us to take away from this because remember we are looking for things that are practical in our lives you know we can read adventist home and we can read child guidance and we can read whatever books may be good and, you know, I remember when I read Adventist Home and Child Guidance, I thought, oh, wow, these are some great principles. But I didn't know how to implement them. Um, you know, they, they sounded great. They looked great on paper. You know, they were very theoretical. And if I could do that, then I believed that I would have a home that was the very home that, you know, the servant of the Lord was speaking of. But I didn't realize that in order for me to experience these things, like when she wrote these books, she's speaking to converted people. My problem extremely. She's speaking to people who already have an experience with the Lord. Like this book, these books are not written for people who, who don't have a relationship with God. Like it, it, it can't be because there's no way that you can do these things except the Holy Spirit be abiding in you and accept Christ give you the power to do them. So the first thing that I want us to realize is that obedience and unselfishness are really almost one in the same, like they go together. And if you get just that one thing from this scope, it will fundamentally transform the way that you parent. Because what we're really striving against with our children is the selfish nature. And if you guys are anything like me, you know, my children didn't go to daycare. My daughter went to daycare for like six weeks because I worked for the census in 2000. So I took her to daycare while I trained. But other than that, my, my son has never been to daycare. My daughter didn't go to daycare. They haven't been to school. And so I always thought little children are bad or pick up bad habits at the daycare, at school. And so when my children started manifesting these problems, like I was shocked <laughs> because I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like she bit you. Like, how did she learn to bite? Like only children at daycare bite, right? And so <laughs> most beautiful self-denial. So I was thoroughly confused, not realizing that when children are born, they have the natural heart, except that we are blessed to have the experience of Elizabeth and our child is born with the Holy Spirit, um, you know, I, that experience was not mine. You know, I, I didn't realize that while I was pregnant, I should be denying myself and, and praying that my children would be born with the Holy Spirit. And so there was lacking from my life this fundamental understanding that self-denial and obedience go together. Why do your children not do what you tell them to do? Because they don't want to. Because, you know, put away your toys. Okay, but I was playing with that, right? They're, they're getting some gratification. They don't want to do what you're telling them to do because what you're telling them is, is not fun. You know, I don't want to go to bed because I want to stay up because you're not going to bed. You know, I want to stay up with mommy and daddy. And I want to watch TV and, and whatever. They don't want to miss what's going on in the household. And so the point is, the children have not been taught how to deny self because that is where the obedience comes. So the reason that the story of the rich young ruler is so important is because he was not willing to deny self. Now, here's the key. 
And this is the, really the beauty of this story. And I, I believe personally, one of the reasons this story is in the Bible is because the rich young ruler's life did not have to end that way. He came to Christ. He had all this money. He was a selfish young man. He knew Christ had what he needed, but he wasn't willing to give up what he needed to give up in order to follow Christ. And so many of us, we stop there. I have this issue. I have these little bad children. I'm not having any victory. My husband gets on my nerves. The church, like everything in life, it's not where it should be. And so the beauty of the gospel is that is the whole reason that Christ died. Like that's why he came to the earth for people like that, for people who don't have it together, for people who don't know how to get together, for people have thing, who have things in their life that they don't want to give up. That's why Christ died. So when you have something that you don't want to give up and watch now, because I'm going to transition this to the children. So first, mommy has to have victory. When you have something in your life that you don't want to give up, whatever it is, it could be a food item. It could be, you know, hatred towards someone. It could be a dress issue, whatever the issue is. And you have something that is a cherished idol you don't have to be afraid to come to Christ. Like a lot of us feel like, well, when I get rid of this, then I'm going to come to Christ. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. That That's legalism. That's, that's self-righteousness. Like, I don't even know. That's, no, that's not Christianity. Christianity is, I have a problem. I'm not obedient to God. I'm going to go to him the way that I am. And I'm just going to be honest. So this is what the rich young ruler should have said. Lord, I have all this money. And I don't know how to give it up. And then Christ would have said, let me teach you how to give it up. Like Christ wouldn't have said, okay, well you leave because you don't know how to get up. No, no. I have all this money. I don't know how to give it up. Lord, will you teach me how to give it up? So that's where we come. Lord, I don't want to get up in the morning. Is it okay to just be real for a minute? Lord, I don't want to. I hear you calling me. I don't want to get up in the morning. Lord, help me to want to get up in the amen. Lord, make us willing to deny self. We as human beings are not naturally willing to deny self. Christ knows that. He knows that. So we don't have to pretend that we want to be Christians, that we want to deny self, that, you know, life is great. We don't have to pretend. We need to be honest. Lord, I don't want to do that. And now I can see clearly why my children are disobedient because like they got it from me right i don't want to do that they don't want to do that like nobody wants to do what they're supposed to be doing and so when we're honest with where we are now god can step in to teach us these principles to use in our home that we can experience victory personally and then once we are experiencing victory then we can teach our children how to experience victory because we have a living relationship. We have a living experience. Okay, so that transitions us into... Let me read this on page 241 in my book. It says, how carefully should parents manage their children in order to counteract every inclination to selfishness? They should continually suggest ways by which their children may become thoughtful for others and learn to do things for their fathers and mothers who are doing everything for them. So this is a power pack quote because one, it tells us that we have to be intentional about teaching our children to not be selfish. And how do we do that? We teach them to think about others 
And I want to say recently on the group, we sent out some ideas of things that we can do to teach our children to not be selfish, whether that be visiting the nursing home, visiting the policemen and the firemen in the area, visiting the elderly people in our church, the, the people that are widows, you know, and, and doing simple things. We have an older lady that we bring to our house sometimes and she loves to just come home and, and have Sabbath dinner with us. Like we're not doing anything special. She just likes to hang out because she's lonely because she lives alone. And so, you know, maybe you go to their house and have a slumber party and you just, you know, they just, they, they love those kinds of things because they just want to know that somebody actually cares. And so this is teaching your children that life is not about them. There are other people that, that need, you know, that need things to be done for them. All right. Um, okay. So there is a nice list that lists some traits of selfishness as opposed to selflessness. And so certainly these are areas that we want to be mindful of in teaching our children. But I want to tie in what we're talking about with, I think principle two and three kind of go together. Um, children respond to love and deal with your children in love. So that's this whole thing of my relationship with Christ is so critical because the first part of the fruit of the spirit is love. All of the other pieces, and I don't want to say fruits because it's, it's just one fruit, but the stem of the fruit, if you will, the, the base of the fruit is love. And then you have all these clusters of other pieces of the fruit that manifest themselves through love. So when you say the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, meekness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, what you're really saying is when the love of God abides in my heart, is planted in my heart, then the outflow the the fruit the manifestation of that love will be joy peace long suffering all those other components that's what that means and so when my children are disobedient how i respond to them will be based on my relationship with god right and that makes sense because if Jesus had children and they were naughty, which they probably wouldn't be, but you guys work with me, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying Jesus' children would be naughty, but if they were naughty, like, would he yell at them? Would he, would he be imp impatient? Um, no, he wouldn't do these things. And so a lot of the effectiveness of our our training, our ability to have our children be obedient will be directly related to how we deal with them because love awakens love. Um, and I don't know where that quote is from. Is that Steps to Christ? Maybe somebody knows where that quote is from. It's either, I want to say it's either Steps to Christ or, I don't know. I can look it up if you guys want it. But there's a quote that says, love awakens love and so if we want our children to be loving if we want them to respond accordingly then we have to discipline them even in love because we can strong arm them strong arm them into doing the right thing but that's not going to help their spiritual relationship that's if anything they're going to get old enough and then they're going to leave the church or, or they're going to be the kind of Christian that is very um, harsh. And, and I'm sure you've seen them because there's many of them in the church. You know, you, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this. And it's, it's a very outward religion that starts from the outside and then supposedly is supposed to work itself inside. But that's not how Christianity works. Christianity begins on the inside and then it works its way outward 
And so now that's how you know a change is taking place because you see the manifestation of the thing. So you know when your children are doing something because they have to and when they're doing it because they feel like they want to help mommy and they want and they want to be obedient and they want to help out around the house. So that's the goal that we're going toward and that's why it's so important to get them when they're young because little kids you know, they want to wash the dishes, right? They they want to sweep the floor, like, like to so much that you're like, oh, go sit down, please. And so, you know, like, they, they want to be um, on top of everything. And so you want to hone in on that desire to help. And yes, it's going to take you twice as long, you know, maybe longer, but it will be worth that sacrifice to teach them how to do what they need to do and then have them want to do it um, because they love, because they love to help. All right. So, um, let's look here. Number four is teaching your child obedience. And I love the, the story here. I'm just trying to, okay, here it is on this, on page 250, it says parents must learn the lesson of implicit obedience to God's voice, which speaks to them out of his word. And as they learn this lesson, they can teach their children respect and obedience in word and action. This is page 283. Thank you. This is the work that should be carried on in the home. Those who do it will reach upward themselves, realizing that they must elevate their children this education means much more than mere education. So this is encapsulating the, the point that I'm trying to get across to you. Notice how the quotation starts out with parents must learn the lesson of implicit obedience. So as we learn to be obedient to God, then God will work on the hearts of our children so that our children are now obedient to us and I think of the scripture that says if I be lifted up Christ speaking I will draw all men to me have mercy amen and so you know it's a hard saying it, it really is a hard saying because really what God is saying is if you want your children to be saved like you need to get your life together like that's what he's saying and so so much of the thought process of our children and how they view God will depend on our behavior towards them. And I remember this quote, I don't know if it's Adventist Home or Child Guidance or somewhere where she says, parents do not make the, your children think that heaven would not be a nice place to be if you were there. Like something to that effect. <laughs> wow. Like. What are our children going to think if, are they not going to want to go to heaven because they think mommy is going to be there? Like if mommy's going to be there, right? Like, I don't want to go, you know, if daddy's going to be there, like, yeah, I'm just going to do something else. And so we want to model to our children the love of Christ so that they get a first-hand encounter of what God's love is really like and not just you love them because they're your children but you're actually modeling godly love to them um, and that includes the self-sacrificing and all these things and okay I just want to keep up with the time here and and all these things so all right any comments before we go on now I don't know about you guys but when I read this story um on the next page over it basically gives this story of this mom and she's I guess in her room or somewhere and she overhears the children in the other room and the little and the little girl I guess is trying to get the little boy to say his prayers <laughs> and he doesn't want to say his prayers and so he's being a naughty little boy and he doesn't want to say his prayers 
but notice the response of the mother. She is, she's crafty. And I don't mean crafty in a bad way, but she is coming to the child. She's asking him, do you love that story? I love the story. And she, before I try to make all these changes, I should just work on me. Okay. Okay. So, so no. So we're not saying that you're just going to be working on you and then let the children just fall off by the wayside. No, no. This is a co-concurrent. I don't know what the word is. This is a, this is a ongoing process, but I just want you to be mindful that a lot of the issues that you're having in your children is directly related to your spiritual state, if that makes sense. So it doesn't mean, you know, I have to wait till I'm fully converted to parent my children. No, no. Okay. And, and let me, and let me say this, remember Christ worked with Peter for three and a half years and Peter still wasn't converted, right? But Peter's in full-time ministry with Christ. He has given up his job. He, he's in full-time ministry and he's not converted. So we can be in full-time ministry, the ministry of working with our children. What did God say to Peter? He said, after you are converted. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means he's not converted. Peter, you've been with the Lord three and a half years and you're not converted? That's what that, I mean, I don't know how else we can take that. Peter was not converted, but does that doesn't mean he was not effective. Um, now, we do see some issues that he had because he wasn't converted, but that doesn't mean just because you're not converted or you're not where you should be doesn't mean that God can't use you. What it means is that you are going to be especially merciful to your children because you realize that they act like this because you have failed them, you know. And I try to say these things gently, but, you know, it's I, I hope it's OK for us to be honest here. Right. Because I'm sure many of us are experiencing this, this is why which is why we're taking this class and I'm not excluded from from these um, issues. And so you realize that you have done things incorrectly. And when you read this story, you're like, oh, I'm not supposed to grab my child and say, you better pray. <laughs> like, that's not how I'm supposed to respond. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not how you're supposed to respond. Um, and so you can see this mother and she takes a little child and she's so patient. And she's like, you know, honey, are you feeling well today? And he's like, mm -hmm, yeah. You know, like he's not even realizing there's a problem. And so she so brilliantly reasons with the child and, and asks him these questions and brings him to the point where he wants to pray. And that's the point, right? So if you make your child pray, like, is that really prayer? Like, I don't even know if we can call that prayer. So if, if we make our children, you know, say you're sorry. Okay, like... The child is not sorry. Like, why is so you're gonna make the child be a liar? I mean, the child's if they're not sorry, you can't make the child be sorry. So, and let's just go there for a minute because I think this is a practical lesson. So, your children get into an argument, you know, one child hits another child, I don't know, whatever they're doing. The child something goes wrong, okay? The child, so what should we do if they're not sorry? Okay, so that's where I'm going. So, if the child is not sorry. The first thing that you want to do is you want to pray, okay? And if you deal with the situation right then will depend upon how escalated the children are, okay? And how escalated you are. So if you're angry and the children are angry and things are just a mess, what Ellen White says she did with her children is she says, children, we're not going to discuss this now. We're going to discuss this later, okay? And I actually learned like this like I, I did this and it works. Okay. And so she says, okay, children, we're, we're not going to discuss this. And then you leave it until you calm down. My kids think you're talking about them. <laughs> and so like, I'm talking about all the children, including my old, right? And so you leave that situation until you calm down, until the children calm down. But in the meantime, you're praying for wisdom you're praying for the hearts of the children that, you know, the Holy Spirit will move upon them 
Um, because some children, and I'm sure you guys have, these, some children are quick to forgive and some of them aren't. You know, some of them, like three months later, they're like, remember when you took my Lego and I was still playing? You know, you're like, what? <laughs> like, we don't even have those Legos anymore. <laughs> and they are like upset because somebody took their Lego and they didn't. And so, so you have to be mindful of the state of your children. Okay, so so let's say that you are, we'll go with both situations. So let's say that you have needed to separate from the situation. You've sent the children maybe to their room to, to do something, to, to keep their minds engaged, you know, so maybe they're sweeping or they're, you know, putting things away or, you know, they're doing something to physical work actually helps to, to, to bring you back to, to, to focus your mind. So when you're upset, it's good to do some, some physical labor to, to kind of balance your mind out. So you do that, you come back, you're ready to discuss the issue. You're going to pray with the children. And the first thing that you want to do that I do is you want to ask, okay, what happened? Okay. You're talking about what happened. You are reasoning with the child as this mother did in the story, you know, and then you ask the child, you know, was that okay? And most children will say, no, you know, it, they know, most children know that what they did was not okay. Now, they may not be sorry for what they did, but they realize that what they did was not okay. So this is where the gospel comes in. Because as long as I know that what I did is wrong, that's all I need. Because now I'm acknowledging my sins. Like that's the first step in conversion that I acknowledge that what I did was wrong. That's what David said. I acknowledge my sins. My transgressions are ever before me. So you first you want to bring the child to the point of acknowledgement, which most children are going to already be there. Okay. So now you're going to take the child from acknowledgement to, okay, well, what do you think you should have done? You know, showing them like where did the situation go wrong so we're talking through this okay i was playing with this lego she came up and took it from me you know she grabbed it i grabbed it back okay so what could you have done so now each child has to be responsible for what they did wrong because usually usually 98 percent of the time in the case of a, a spat a fight both parties have done something they should not have done. Even if the child who instigated it, you know, started it, the child who was involved did not respond in the way that that should have, okay? And that's how the fights happen. Like, it takes two to fight. So if the child takes the Lego and then the other child doesn't say anything, like, there's not a fight, right? So the child could just, you know, I see that all the time. So what you're doing is you are going to the root of the problem and what does it go back to selfishness well he was playing with it but i wanted it so you know i took it <laughs> like duh and so you know i i want it i don't want to wait for it i needed it for my car that i'm making and you know so i took it and you know i'm stronger or i'm used to getting what i want this is what you'll see in the smaller children you know, they still think it's up. you know, you see the little girl, and it's usually the little girl. She comes and she takes the little boy's stuff. It's like, Mom. and she's like, honey, don't worry about it. She's okay. And so now the little girl knows she can do whatever she wants to do, and she's just wreaking havoc and bless the little boy's heart. And so now he's like, okay, this little girl is getting on my nerves. And so, so I hope this is selfishness is at the root of all fights. So what you're dealing with and what you need wisdom from the Holy Spirit for is how to deal with these fights and how to teach the children how to think differently, right? So what could you have done? Like you, do you have to make a car right now? Okay, he's making a car. Like, is there something that could you have asked? And say, hey, do you have an extra one of those parts? And so now you're teaching the children how they can be kind to each other, how they can work out their problems, how maybe they need to wait, you know, or maybe you don't get to play with it at all. You know, maybe it's, you know, so you're, you're teaching them how to work together and how to deny self so that we can all get along. And also, 
You know, here's the thing. Because the children are fighting, and then what does mommy do? Mommy comes in yelling and, you know, throwing it. And now <laughs> the situation goes from bad to worse. You know, now they're upset, and, you know, now everything is just crazy because you didn't take and use the situation as it can get crazy. You didn't use the situation as a learning um, opportunity, as a teaching opportunity to teach the children. This is how you, it's, conf, it's conflict resolution is what you're teaching the children. And so I think this, I like this review of the necessary responses. Amen. Amen. What about kids' personal possessions? They have to have permission. Absolutely. That's a good rule. If it's not yours, so that's a house rule, right? If it's not yours, ask. It's okay to have things that are yours. I mean, that's real life. You know, this this is mine. And so, you know, not everything is just is just public property. There are some things that will be mine. You know, maybe I got something for my birthday. Maybe, maybe my grandmother bought me a camera. And it's mine, right? And so the child should be willing to share, but it shouldn't just be assumed that, okay, well, it's in the house, then I can just use it. No. So you teach your children to be respectful of other people's things. Oh, you leaving? Okay. My husband's leaving. Okay. So you, you teach your children to be respectful of other people's things. And so you ask may I, may I use this? You know, it, that could be for things that are in the refrigerator. Now, some things in the refrigerator are common property for everyone, right? But some things are in, that are in the refrigerator. Somebody was eating that. Like how many times have you gone to the refrigerator and your kids have eaten? I'm like, did you eat? Oh. And you got your mouth all ready to eat it <laughs> and it's gone. Like, that's not okay. You ask, you want to share, but it's not just because in the, it's in the refrigerator, it's yours. No, there are, there are common items in there and then there are items. This is mine. I'm more than happy to share it with you, um, but that doesn't mean that you don't ask. Okay, so I, I hope that answers that question. Okay, so, um, and in this story, I love it so much because it gives it gives both responses right and so the mom says you know well that is very naughty you ought always to say your prayers go back right now and say them and so now the little boy his heart is not subdued so he's praying but he's upset when all that needed to be done was to take a few moments figure out what's going on with the child reason with the child now here's the thing and we'll get to this with the rod and actually the rod's the next page so we can go right into it i'm rebuked and showing my children god's character and discipline yeah amen that's why we're doing this and so because you know some of these things some of us have known these things and then we kind of fall off some of us have never known these things and so that's the beauty of this is that we're not just saying, you know, do this with your children. You shouldn't do this. You got, you have to know how to implement it and how to do it. So I'm so glad you're here, Allison. You have been a, an asset to this group. So I'm, I'm glad that you share your, your personal experiences with us. All right. So it talks about the rod and we'll go ahead and talk about the rod in discipline since that's kind of where we are in this, um, scenario so you you're with the child you've separated you know the situation was bad right you've separated you've cooled off the children have cooled off they've had time to think about what happened you prayed again you talked about you know what should have happened and and the child is just not bending now this normally happens in children who have been allowed to do whatever they want to do for so long and they're just not going to give in. So, so now it may be time to administer some physical discipline because, but you, now key, you have calmed down. You're not beating the child in anger. Okay. You're, you're, you're not, no, this is not, you know, you better do what I say and I'm your mother and you'll do it. 
no. And I have said those things, you know, you better, you better do what I say because I'm in charge, you know, no, no. We don't ever want to have that spirit of I'm in charge and you do what I say because that's not how God is with us. God is not that kind of God. He's not like just I'm God and you'll do what I say. No, the Bible says I have loved thee with an everlasting love, with everlasting kindness have I drawn thee. That's what the word says. God draws us with his kindness, with his love. Now, you may do some things that have effects and you may suffer those effects, but God is not. And he does rebuke and chasten those that he loves, but it's not his business to just, you know, make us feel bad for what we've done. He loves us and he gives us guidelines because he wants to protect us. So this is what we're going to do with our children. Okay. And let's see. It talks about the word rod and all of the things that it means. A branch or a tribe. A rod of correction, which is what we just talked about. A scepter. A lance. A staff. And one thing that I learned that I, I had known and I did not do this. Is that what you use as the rod should be something that bends. Like, you know, what we call growing up a switch. Um, and you know, I actually used like a little wooden spoon and I drew a sad face on it and it was Mr. Sad Spoon and you know, you didn't want to have to visit Mr. You didn't want to have to have a visit for Mr. Sad Spoon. And so, right. And so, um, I didn't use switches because in my mind, like that's what the old people did who didn't know what they were doing. And so, you know, I, I didn't want to have that. It, it was a, it was a negative connotation in my mind to use the switch but reading this i realized that we actually should um right mine was a wooden spoon too like all the parents that i knew all use wooden spoons so i had never um known that what you use should be bendable and that makes sense right because you're not trying to harm the child you just kind of want to give that sting to let them know that this is not a pleasant experience um, and sin stings. Sin, sin stings. No matter how old you are, sin stings. And some of us older people need a spanking, right? <laughs> You're like, can somebody just spank me so I can act right? Um, but we we just want our children to feel that sting to shouldn't use the hand for spanking. No, and I don't know if this lesson covered that, but let me tell you what my grandfather taught me. My grandfather taught me to never use my hand. This is when... My daughter was just a little thing. He said, never spank her with your hand because it teaches your children to be afraid of you. Um, and I don't know that I've ever even read that anywhere else, but, but my grandfather said that and it, and it sounds wise. And so that's when I got the spoon. And so I, I never hit my children with my hand. Um, I shouldn't say I never hit them because I have. So maybe one day I'll go into those stories, but I have been delivered from that. Okay. And so <laughs> praise God, but, um, never like those, you know, and usually we, we hit our children with our hand as a, you know, that's what people do, right? You get, when I was growing up in school, like nobody had guns or knives, you just got beat up, right? You just, you know, and the person who could fight, you know, that was like the rainy person and you better not mess with her because she'll beat you down. And so we bring that mentality like into our parenting, you know, you better do what I say or I'm, you know, I'm going to beat you and uh -uh, uh -uh. that is, that is not of God. That, that is satanic is, is the nicest word that I can give it. That is, that is satanic in all its forms. So we're, we're not trying to beat our children in submission and, you know, my power is greater than, so what do you do? You know, when your son is the biggest one in the family, you know, not, I mean, like, what do you do then? Right. So we want to draw their hearts. We want to win their love, their trust, their affection. And most times, 98% of the time, kindness will work. Okay. Now, there are some times when when is too old to spank. I don't, I don't know that I, I would say, I don't know, maybe, maybe about for this. So the lesson is like the two through eight grades. I would say by the time they're about third, fourth grade, 
You should not be spanking your children. Now, if you have waited until they're older to implement these disciplines, then they may have to be a little older, you know, and, and you're spanking them. But if you start early enough and if you really work with God in prayer, right, and the other disciplinary actions. And so that's the one thing that the Holy Spirit will work with you on. He will give you ideas of things that you can do with your children. And every child is different. Like my daughter, I would send her outside on a run and like it worked every time. Like she would come back like a normal person. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and she, like she's not like the athletic type. And But if I sent her on a run around the backyard a few times, you know, it's, it's like she came to her senses or something. And of course I'm praying and, you know, she's praying. But that, that and I learned that from um, the, the Honebergers. Is that how you say their name? Um, what's that lady's name? Jim and what's the lady's name? Homeburger. I can see her face, but I can't think of her name. You guys know who I'm talking about. Sally. Sally Homeburger. Um, thank you. And so I learned that from Sally to send your children outside and let them run. And that and that worked for my daughter. And for my son, he was more he would do anything for food. And so, you know, if I threatened to take away his dessert or <laughs> You know, he can't have any extra portion. I mean, that just kind of, you know, or push-ups work for him. So if he does some push-ups, you know, it's something about that physical activity, which, which I was going to share this and it just came to my mind. So let me share it now. Physical activity will help, especially for boys in disobedience. And we learn in an earlier lesson that the body was designed for action and something about moving and little boys, little girls who have just been sitting in the house all day, like something happens to their brain. But if they are moving, so if you notice that your children are misbehaving, get them outdoors. Let them run around. Let them run off some of that extra, I don't know what it is. And what brought this to my mind is we have a little dog. He's a Chihuahua Rat Terrier mix. And as long as we walk, so we go on a walk every morning, we walk for one hour. As long as we are walking like, he's a normal little dog. But if we don't walk and we don't take him, like, he becomes the craziest little dog. He runs around the house. He barks at everything. I mean, he's just a crazy little dog. But as long as he's getting his walking in six, seven days a week, he is a totally different creature. And so it reminded me that our children are often the same way. Our children can have cabin fever. You know, you've been in the house cooped up all day. You've been doing schoolwork all day. Children need to work. They need to get outside. They need to run. And if you live up in the north where it's cold, you need to find some activity that you can do in the house. Whether it be you can do jumping jacks, you can run in place. You can still do activity to help the children get this craziness you know, out of their system and you will find that you won't have as many issues.